Thank you. It's a great, it's a, a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship today. I beg to move that this House has considered the UK's relationship with Mexico. Can I start by thanking the Backbench Business Committee for giving time for this debate. I am looking forward to hearing from my colleagues, all of whom I know have a deep interest in Mexico and its people. I'm pleased to have secured the debate, not just because we're nearing the 213th anniversary of Mexican independence and 200 years since the establishment of UK uh, diplomatic relations with Mexico, but because I believe this is the first time since 1938 that this Parliament has found time to specifically debate UK-Mexico relations. And given Mexico's immense economic, geopolitical and cultural importance the world over, I trust the honourable members present will agree that this discussion is long overdue. I am also pleased to be able to say that this debate is taking place in a far warmer diplomatic climate than its predecessor 85 years ago. And I'm sure no one here will need reminding that in 1938 our two countries had just severed diplomatic ties. The Mexican government of the time, fresh off a progressive social revolution, had moved to exp expropriate foreign oil companies, prompting our own government to suspend bilateral relations until 1942. Today, of course, the situation is reassuringly different. For several decades, the United Kingdom and Mexico have enjoyed a close and fruitful relationship, the continued success of which I know will be predicated on the principles of cooperation and mutual respect. A shining example of this is the British Mexico Society, which recently celebrated its 70th anniversary. We're also able to enjoy the fruits of this relationship through the all-party parliamentary group for Mexico, which next month I will be able to say I've had the privilege of chairing for five years. And I want to take this opportunity to thank the current ambassador to the UK, Josefa Gonzalez Blanco, a friend, as well as all of her team at the Embassy of Mexico, who have used their position to strengthen diplomatic ties at every opportunity and showcase, in particular, Mexican culture on these shores. I have to say as well, few APP chairs will receive the sheer number of invitations that I do uh, to events hosted by the Embassy showcasing just that culture and music and vibrancy that Mexico has to offer. And let me also praise our ambassador in Mexico City, John Benjamin. He is a good friend and one of the finest representatives we could have in Mexico City. Today I intend to speak on a few areas. Let me start with our current economic relationship with Mexico. In 2021, Mexican foreign direct investment into our economy totaled £16.3 billion, while trade between our two countries amounts to £4.9 billion a year. But there are many more opportunities to expand this relationship. Britain's imminent accession to the CPTPP should represent an opportunity to give a significant boost to the size and scale of our trade with Mexico. And on the whole, this should be a welcome development. But I would also urge my fellow members, fellow honourable members here, to hold on to a degree of caution. As is the case with any trade agreement, the CPTPP risks falling prey to the organising logic of our current system of global trade, which without scrutiny can prioritise narrow interests over the wider needs of communities, working people and the environment. And I hope then that as a member of the CPTPP, Britain will work together with Mexico in supporting the agreement's existing provisions and furthering them on issues of labour rights and environmental protection, which I know are also priorities for the Mexican government. In November last year, I asked the Minister, the Honourable Member for Chelsea and Fulham, what progress had been made in securing a bilateral free trade agreement with Mexico. And he assured me 
that talks were progressing positively. The Foreign Secretary echoed this sentiment in his speech delivered in Chile in May, pointing out the recent completion of a third round of talks. I welcome today an update from the Minister on these discussions and would also appreciate it if you tell us if the Government is still planning to appoint a trade envoy to Mexico. I hope negotiations will be successful and a deal will be agreed on soon. I fear sometimes the Mexican Government feels like it is not the priority of the UK Government and we must make sure that that is not the case. In the same speech the Foreign Secretary made in Chile, he also sought to conjure the, the ghost of George Canning. Canning, if I may again direct members' attention to another slice of our history with Mexico, was Foreign Secretary during the Spanish-American Wars of Independence in the early 19th century. And in this position, he resolved to swiftly recognise the newly won sovereignty of the fledgling American republics. Indeed, it was because of Canning that Britain became the first European power to establish formal bilateral relations with independent Mexico. And conservative politicians are fond of this historical anecdote. They reach for it almost every time they speak publicly about the UK's relationship with Latin America. And it's easy to see why. On first blush, it certainly appears to be a solely positive story. However, considering that the UK's historical attitude towards the region has too often been defined by either indifference or commercial exploitation. It is reassuring to be reminded that our history there started on such a bright mark. But the version that gets relayed in speeches like the Foreign Secretary's is doused with a more than healthy dose of myth. Canning support for Mexico and other Spanish American countries did not stem solely from an unnerving commitment to the shared values of liberty and democracy. It was part of a calculated strategy to advance Britain's imperial interests and consolidate its primacy in Europe. Canning said as much himself, declaring in 1826 that he had spoke, spoken the new world into existence to redress the balance of the old, a famous sentence that the Foreign Secretary also cited in his speech. Canning, in short, saw the UK's support for Latin America as a means to an end. And in the succeeding decades, that support was repeatedly withdrawn whenever it was politically yeah. expedient. Yeah. The point, Mr Gray, I'm seeking to get across here, the hidden lesson from Canning's story, I think, is that for Britain to truly strengthen its political, economic and cultural relationship with Mexico, as as successive governments have consistently stated, is a central diplomatic objective. We need to approach that relationship as something positive and desirable within itself. And I believe it is here that we find the true crux of successful bilateralism. We cannot treat our relationships with Latin, America country, Latin American countries as pawns on a chessboard. We cannot view them purely as opportunities for the wealthy few to further enrich themselves. And our support for the principles of national sovereignty, self-determination and mutual respect cannot be solely symbolic. We must not appear to be more interested in protecting a few commercial interests over building a lasting framework for international cooperation. This approach to foreign policy is not only objectionable, it's unsuited to the 21st century. Plainly, it's ineffective. As we gear up for an age of genuinely global challenges, we have to lay the foundations for meaningful multilateral action now. There are no viable solutions to problems like climate change that don't involve closely coordinated international action. And I believe that Britain is incredibly well placed to play a leading role in this effort. But in order to do that, we must first shed the last vestiges of colonial paternalism and single-minded self-interest. The way we choose to manage our relationship with Mexico and other countries in that region and countries across the global south will determine our capacity to do just that. If I may make a third and final reference to Mexican history and borrow 
from the words of Benito Juarez, the first indigenous president of Mexico, which I believe capture the sentiment I've sought to convey today. He said, among individuals, as among nations, respect for the rights of others is peace. It is in the spirit of these words that I say the following. I have no doubt that the Mexican people understand their country's challenges far more intimately than I ever will. For them, the epidemics of femicide, disappearances, and drug-related violence are not abstractions, but terrifyingly common features of their lived reality. 152 journalists were killed in Mexico between 1992 and 2023. Every day, 10 women and girls are murdered by intimate partners or family members. 100,000 people are currently disappeared. That's 100,000 families who are saddled with the heart-wrenching burden of not knowing whether their loved ones are dead or alive. There are also, of course, the dislocating effects of climate change. As a result of its tropical latitude, Mexico is vulnerable to drought, food insecurity, and the increased frequency of extreme weather events. And the country's status as one of the most biodiverse places on Earth further raises the stakes. I don't raise these points in an accusatory way. Indeed, we in Britain must also reflect on how our own legal and social relationship to drugs, as well as our consumption habits more broadly, contribute to the enormous human cost borne by the American people. I draw attention to them, rather, to remind members that the UK has to, as a matter of course, assert its commitment to support Mexico and to help it tackle these subst substantial challenges. Not as a finger-waving imperial power, but as an equal partner, sincerely invested in that country's success. And I believe wholeheartedly that Mexico has at its disposal all the ingredients to develop into an unqualified success story. Its young population, burgeoning industrial capacity, its rich cultural tapestry can all conspire to ensure that Mexico attains its obvious potential. And it's for these reasons that it would be so encouraging to see a visa arrangement akin to that which the Foreign Office has secured with the Uruguay. Indeed, any future trade deal with Mexico included in any future trade deal with Mexico. This would allow young Mexicans and Britons to live and work in each other's countries for a period of two years. Such an agreement would allow a new generation of young people to join the likes of D.H. Lawrence and Leona Carrington in the great tradition of Britons who found in Mexico the dynamism and inspiration that allowed them to produce some of their best work. And it is on that note that I finish my contribution and I look forward to hearing the contributions of others uh, on this important relationship for the UK. Thank you, Mr. Gray.